Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to really think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor and enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. And Sarah Cottingham. Hi. And we're going to focus on the work of Isabel, which I know we're very, very interested, Chris, to get under the skin of. But first, Chris, what's your reading for? Hey, what you reading for? So this week I have been reacquainting myself with a little bit of a, a classic of books that there are on things like reading for pleasure and reading discussions. It's a book called, oh, actually, it's actually a combination of two books, Tell Me and the Reading Environment by Aidan Chambers. Now, if you come to this book looking for um, a body of evidence or you're looking for that kind of thing, you're going to be disappointed. That's not what this is about. It is someone who clearly knows a lot about teaching children, knows a lot about pedagogy, and who is an incredibly has an incredibly inspiring way of talking about reading, discussing what they know about the subject. And it's for someone like me who's constantly digging into bits of evidence here or there to read a book that just kind of puts that all to one side and says, this is what I know this is what I've learned, this makes sense to me, is actually really refreshing. It's a really inspiring book. If you you feel like you've got caught up too much in the nuts and bolts of how to teach reading and you want to feel re-inspired, reinvigorated to get back to that real understanding of why you do it, then um, this book or pair of books that are together is uh, one that I'd highly recommend you check out. What about you, Sarah? What are you reading for? I have just read a paper by um, authors called McDaniel and Einstein, great surname, and it's called uh, Training Learning Strategies to Promote Self-Regulation and Transfer the Knowledge, Belief, Commitment and Planning Framework. So a nice catchy title. Um, But essentially, um, I am interested in how, well, a couple of things, how, how much we need to teach Uh, students about learning and how they learn and how we get them to use the strategies that we think are good for their learning this framework kind of speaks to that 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 latter point about how do we get them to actually use strategies because the strategies we often want them to use are things like uh, retrieval spacing stuff like that and they're actually really effortful and not particularly kind of fun to use. So how do we get them to do it? And so these authors, they they created this framework and it's called the Knowledge, Belief, Commitment and Planning Framework. And it draws on principles from uh, behavioral science as well as um, like uh, just like stuff about the strategies themselves to try to like build people's mental models of these strategies, but also to make it easy for them to actually implement it in their in their own revision, in their own study. Um, and I really found it interesting because um, if any of your listeners have, have read the EEF guidance on professional development, they talk about mechanisms drawn from behavior change. And actually this framework seems quite similar to this idea of like we can use behavior change to change teachers behavior and also to kind of change students behavior as well um, so that's that's what I've been reading Kieran what, what are you reading for so I think this book has been suggested before but I'm, I'm going to bring it back again reflect expect check explain several reasons one it's very very difficult to write a book with humility humor and high quality co- content and i think this book does that in in spades you know i recently had to reread it uh it's sort of doing some work and it was just as engaging as the first time but actually i find so much more that i'd almost missed and i know chris that you are a you're sort of a, as big a fan of this book as as i am and really i just want to reshare my love of this book in the hope that others will uh, will take the time because it's it's definitely a summer book but well worth the read over the the summer break yeah i love that book love that book so much i think the interesting thing is i think i've said it before craig barton's first book was something that really turned me on to kind of cognitive psychology and that kind of stuff really 
wonderful book, but there are other books that do that sort of thing quite well as well. So it's one of a selection that could be your step into this stuff. I've not read anything that talks about, I mean, indirectly, he might not describe it in these terms, but talks about procedural variation and a practical way to think about procedural variation and to use it in the classroom. I've not read anything that's quite as um, interesting and practical on the subject as this. I think it's I mean, I loved his first book, but I think this is a, a step above. It's one of the most fascinating books I've read on the subject of mathematics. Love it to bits. I do think it's a bit of an underappreciated gem. Sarah, it's absolutely fantastic to have you here with us. You know, we're very fans of your blog and your work in general. Before we get to Isabel, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. I'm also a big fan of your podcast um, and uh, I've listened to many episodes, especially since meeting Chris uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, so uh, I'm currently uh, an associate dean in the learning design team at Ambition Institute, which is a lot of words. <laughs> um, but essentially, it means that I get the absolute pleasure um, to head up a small team that work on our MPQ in leading literacy, of which um, Chris is a part, uh, and our wonderful colleague Sarah. Um, and um, the other part of my role is that I get to oversee the iteration of the um, MPQs, the specialist MPQs, um, which is really fun because we get to kind of look at data, figure out um, what's working, what's not, and then start to think about how we can make it a better um, learning and user experience for, um, for participants. Before that, I worked for Teach First and I was training teachers who were brand new to the profession. And that was incredibly fun, um, really high intensity uh, and really, really fun. And I got to meet some, some very interesting people. Um, before that, I was an English teacher. Um, so uh, I do want to read Craig Barton's book, though, still, despite, despite being an English teacher. Um, uh, and that, that was great. Um, and yeah, I just I came to teacher education through be, being a mentor. Um, and just really enjoying uh, working with teachers. Um, more recently, I've been studying a master's in educational neuroscience, which has got me interested um, particularly in memory um, and how, how that works in terms of kind of um, the brain in particular. And more recently, I've started uh, writing um, a book on uh, the man who we're going to talk about today um, on Ashevel. Um, and Chris has been integral in kind of helping me to, to sort of um, get going with that. I mean, that master sounds really interesting. That must be awesome. And you, you did that in your spare time? Uh, yeah, I went down to part time and then I was uh, kind of doing it, doing it part time as well. And it was, yeah, hearing it was brilliant. It was just absolutely fascinating. It was really, really difficult, um, but absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, it makes me want to do another master's at some point as well. The focus of this episode will be the work of Isabel. Can you sum up Isabel's key ideas? Yeah, I started um, I started writing them down here and then I, I wrote, wrote about five pages. So I have to be a bit more brief because this is this is the overarching question where I'm just summarizing. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit of background because I think um, it's like when you're reading a novel and then you discover that you sort of read about the author and their life and then the novel starts to sort of fit into place a bit better. So a little bit of background um, from what I can, can gauge is that Ajibel was essentially writing at a time um, when like behaviorism was, was very popular. That was the, there was the view that kind of we don't need to look inside the black box of the mind and really think about learning in that perspective. We can just look at behavior and we can just look at associations. Um, and actually what Ajibel was saying is, is no, like uh, when we're thinking about learning, we actually are thinking about the mind and psychology and we need to like really um, dig into that. So he was kind of reacting against um, that movement. And he was also reacting against um, this idea that, that, to be meaningful to students, you have to let them discover everything. So he's he's quite vocal about like um, discovery learning can be meaningful, but it doesn't. You don't have to do discovery learning for um, for learning to be meaningful. And he was kind of reacting against that as well. So kind of against that backdrop, um, his key ideas are essentially that the goal of, of, of learning or a goal of learning in school is to build bodies of knowledge 
so for uh, for pupils to build kind of bodies of knowledge in the in subjects um, we don't want them to kind of have these like little islands of ideas we want them to be connected up in bodies of knowledge and those are really usable um, for um, for pupils and they're something that's going to really kind of to help them um, progress with their knowledge and in order to store kind of vast amounts of knowledge because our brains are kind of because our minds are kind of not like computers we can't just like chuck things in and save them because that's not the case we have to learn it, we have to get pupils to learn in a meaningful way so he talks about this idea of meaningful learning um, and we'll come to that in a little bit more detail later on but in summary it's essentially the idea that you need to connect new information to prior knowledge. So you need to sort of connect it up almost like sewing it into like a tapestry of knowledge rather than just trying to sort of stamp it into your, into your brain. So it's not about pure retention of knowledge, it's about kind of weaving it into this body of knowledge. And that allows knowledge to be stored in, in a more long-term sense, but also it allows it to be more available allows for things like transfer, which is kind of like the holy grail of, of, of education. Um, and one thing he stresses in particular is that what we can learn and what learners can learn is very dependent on what they already know. And that's like his famous quote, um, which some of your, your listeners might know, is that if he had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, that he would say that the most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach him accordingly. So that, that what he calls cognitive structure, the prior knowledge that the learner has, dictates what they can learn. And so a lot of the kind of stuff which we'll talk about later about how to teach um, pupils is about ensuring that they have the relevant prior knowledge necessary to understand what you're going to teach them. So I'll stop there on like the, the kind of overarching stuff. So I know we're going to dig into more specific things uh, later on. You mentioned there this idea of bodies of knowledge and from my comparably limited reading of Alcibel. He's not um, vague or not not particularly vague about what he means by bodies of knowledge. And what I mean by that is he talks about seemingly knowledge being organised in some kind of hierarchical fashion in which more generalised, you might say, higher order concepts are to some extent above and help to organise concepts that are less general, more specific. Is that the case? Have I got the right end of the stick there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, just as you said, um, Chris, he, he talks about if, if we almost like imagine it like so you've got, yeah, you've got the kind of the, your more generalized concepts. And you and I, when we talk, we talk about we give a simple example of like the concept of mammals being a more generalized concept than like um, lion, tiger, human and like types of mam mammals, essentially. So those that more generalized concept would sit above the, the more kind of um, specific ideas and the reason that he talks about it being like that is because these generalized concepts um, Ashabel talks about them as being like anchoring ideas so they help to stabilize more detailed information such that like if you're going to teach um, pupils about something you will consider making sure that they've got these more generalized concepts in mind in order to make sense of the more detailed information. So we talked about the mammals one, didn't we? You might also kind of talk, you might also think about it, like if, if a history example might be, if you're teaching about like the, the Romans and you might think about like government as being like a, a particular concept and, you know, Latin as being another concept that you want to teach about. And those are sort of slightly more detailed concepts and underneath them will sit even more detailed information and what you would want to make sure is that pupils understand these like more kind of generalized concepts first and then uh, you can start to sort of um, anchor help that they, they can anchor the more detailed stuff that you'll teach. I always thought that this made quite an interesting contrast with bits and pieces that I've read about variation theory so where there is this idea of learning a concept by um, looking at lots of different examples and the variation within those examples allowing you and the, the, the careful choice of variation within those examples allowing you to discern what the concept is he's looking at it not in a way that necessarily conflicts with that 
but that kind of ties into that by saying that th it's actually particularly beneficial to start off with this higher order concept before you start looking below that so perhaps making sure that pupils have a general sense of what a quadrilateral is before you look at rectangles squares um squares being a type of rectangle of course but you know what i mean like parallelograms rhombuses etc i'd like to pick up on something you mentioned there you're talking about bodies of knowledge and before that you're talking about this idea of meaningful learning and i can imagine some people immediately thinking well what, what exactly do you mean by meaningful learning you've hinted at the idea that there's kind of connections on some level how does this what is how would he define meaningful learning and how does that say contrast with you know rote learning yeah so it's a great question um so uh, Ashibos theory is actually called assimilation theory. The idea behind learning meaningfully is that you are essentially assimilating prior knowledge, so stuff that's already in your cognitive structure, with the new information that you are being exposed to, be it you reading it or a teacher teaching it to you, or whatever it is. So to learn meaningfully, you have to have that kind of assimilation, that connection, and then a new meaning is kind of like born out of that connection. And you change your prior knowledge changes because you've, you've, you've kind of connected something with it. The information as it was transmitted to you is not the same as it was transmitted to you. So if you're trying to explain something to me, Chris, something new to me, as you're intending it to, as you're intending it, it, that isn't how it's understood by me because it's it's it has to be understood in relation to my prior knowledge which is um necessarily different from from your own um, understanding so you get this you get this sense that that you've got your prior knowledge you've got your new this new idea and it, they come together and this new meaning is, is is kind of born out of that and that is meaningful learning um and that exists on a kind of continuum um, where at the very end of that is this idea of like rote, the, the other end of it is, is rote uh, memorization, I suppose. Um, and Ajibel is very clear that he doesn't think that anything that really goes on in the classroom is rote memorization, really. Um, we don't usually ask children to kind of rote memorize things without trying to connect it in some way to what they already know. Um, but an example of, of like rote um, memorization would be if you just got um, pupils to learn a like a poem in a language they don't understand or something like that, and they really can't like easily connect it to anything they know. Um, he also gives a nice example um, of this difference between like rote and meaningful and how they interact. Um, when he talks about um, a an actor learning their lines, so let's say um, you gave um, an actor a script and you said, like, you know, learn your lines, but you didn't tell them anything about what was going to happen, what actually like, the overarching themes of the play were and why it was written. Um, so they're trying to learn these lines. They might try to commit them to memory. And that's quite rote learning. They're just trying to commit these lines to memory, but they don't really understand the character or the story. But then if you sit them down and then you talk to them about the character's motivations and, you know, the themes of the story and the context, and they suddenly got that like, you suddenly kind of furnished with them with all this, like, um, I suppose, um, more generalized concepts that they can use. And then when they're trying to learn their lines, they're like connecting that to that sort of background knowledge. And they're able to they're able to remember it way more easily because they understand why their character is doing certain things and um, so that would fall more down the kind of meaningful learning end of the scale so Ajibel's not saying that rote learning has no place in learning he thinks that sometimes things need to be learnt kind of perfectly for example the actor at some point will need to learn the lines rote they will need to kind of get exact like verbatim kind of memorization of the lines but he sort of says that mostly in school, what we want is we want it to fall like more down the kind of meaningful end of the of the spectrum. I think where this distinction gets really even more interesting is where he talks about forgetting. So he draws a distinction about what forgetting is when we're talking about something that's at the rote end of the spectrum and something that's at the meaningful end of the spectrum. And as much as I'd love to have a go at explaining that it would be foolish of me to do so given that we've got you here so could you talk a little bit more about that for us oh you're so right that is so I, I think this is this is a really fascinating bit of it so 
if you learn something um, in a more rote fashion, so um, thinking about like lines of a play, if you're just trying to cram them into your brain and you can't, you're not sort of integrating them with anything, you're just trying to sort of brand them into your brain. And um, as Yipo says that that's, that what happens is, is that that kind of um, memorization, that rote memorization is subject to what is called interference. So we're constantly thinking about things all the time. We have this like a stream of consciousness. And if we try to kind of cram things in, they can get very easily mixed up and disturbed by other events that kind of happen around them. But we start to, and we probably see this in, in real life all the time, where you start, you know, say you've gone to two weddings in two weeks, you start to mix up what happened at one wedding, what happened at another wedding, it all kind of get, gets a bit blurry. And that's like interference, things just start to sort of get a bit, bit confused. And that's what happens, um, as Yvonne says, when we try to rote learn things. But if we learn things meaningfully, you remember that meaningful learning is like weaving it into that body of knowledge. It's far more stable. It's not subject to this kind of interference because it's kind of made its way into a sort of network kind of tapestry of knowledge such that it's not kind of interfered with by other events so easily. So forgetting actually progresses differently. And I think it might, might be good to come on to that when we talk about subsumption and assimilation in, in more detail. But it's really interesting that like, actually the way that pupils learn and connect information actually determines the fate of the memory. Because then the, as time proceeds and forgetting happens, you can either get this interference and suddenly the memory is just all kind of shattered into bits and you can't really work out what, where was, what was what or you can get this other progression of forgetting that's um, a bit more um, forgiving, I think, in, in the way it happens. Honestly, I think now might be the perfect time to dive into this kind of idea of subsumption, this idea of um, there being subsuming concepts, the, which is like the anchor concept that you described before, and that quite often that's a, like a higher order concept which you're attaching things to. And so... Well, unless I'm mistaken, what you're saying about this idea of forgetting when it's something's been learned meaningfully, it's that you lose this distinction between the two. You lose the distinction between the new learning and this kind of higher order concept. Is that roughly right? Is there more detail to it than that? Yeah, and I think it's so. This is so theoretical. That I think we need to like abstract is the best word for it. But yeah, that we need to get a bit concrete. So I was trying to think about a really good concrete example of this. So when, when, you learn, when you learn things meaningfully, we talked about how, just as you said, Chris, you've got this, this gem, more general concept and that's your prior knowledge. That's the stuff in, in your head. It's a, it can be a more general concept. And then you learn more specific stuff and that connects to the concept. And it starts to, it, if you think about like a Venn diagram, you kind of get the, the prior knowledge is one of the circles and the new knowledge is this other circle and they're connected. And that's nice because you can distinguish your prior knowledge from um, the new stuff, the new meaning that you've made. But then if you almost imagine that this Venn diagram sort of starts, starts to slide into each other and it kind of goes further and further such that it becomes almost like one circle rather than two circles. So that's what Azibel says happens during forgetting of things that you've learned meaningfully. What happens is the, your prior knowledge kind of takes over and engulfs the new meaning that you made. And, it, and, and at some point in time, you can't distinguish the new meaning from the prior knowledge that you had. I've got a, a, an example of this sort of thing, um, not quite the perfect example, but it, it happens a lot. And I think hopefully people can relate. Um, when you when you kind of go to a meeting and, you, and you're talking about uh, ideas with someone and you bring an idea to the meeting, that's your prior knowledge. You're bringing your thoughts, something you've thought about your idea to the meeting. And then other people kind of talk about their ideas as well. And they might critique your idea and um, get, or add detail to your idea and, and, and things like that. And when you leave the meeting after a few days, you can only really remember your idea still. You can't really remember all the things that other people said. And what's happened there is you've kind of subsumed the detail and, and the stuff that they've said to you into your prior knowledge and you're just left with your prior knowledge. Um, so that's what happens um, when, um, when subsumption or assimilation kind of goes too far. And that's the forgetting process, according to Azure Belt, kind of uh, 
subsumption has gone too far and your prior knowledge has swallowed up the new meaning that you made and you can't remember it anymore. And we'll talk a bit more about, I suppose, later about what we might do to prevent that from happening, because we obviously want our pupils to hang on to those new meanings that they've made. What I love about this idea of forgetting when it comes to meaningful learning as well is this this thing that you suggested before about the idea that even if you kind of forget this distinction, the original concept that you had, this original anchoring concept can still have changed to some extent. So the example I think we've discussed before was the idea of, um, let's say you know what a gas is. You've got a general idea of what a gas is. You've had that picture drawn by a teacher of the, the little circles in a box being spread out. And you learn about, um, say, different kinds of gases. You learn about nitrogen or N2, or you learn about carbon dioxide or CO2. And this changes your understanding of what a gas can be. These little circles can actually represent molecules that have other, you know, that aren't just single things. These are kind of comp like little compounds. And what we take from that over time is, you know, originally we go, oh yeah, I know what carbon dioxide is. I know that nitrogen is, what nitrogen is, and I know that that's a type of gas. But if forgetting happens, what you end up with is you forget what nitrogen is, you forget what carbon dioxide is, and yet on some level, your understanding of what a gas is, that original anchoring concept has changed. You know, you, you know now that, oh, actually, I know that a gas doesn't just have to be you know, single atoms, it can be atoms that are connected, can be the particles that are behind it. Even if you've forgotten this um, new, these new ideas the, or the, of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, your original anchoring concept can have changed. So you can have learned something, even though the thing that you've tried to be originally taught about has uh, been, in, in essence, forgotten, which, which I love. Anything that takes the idea of forgetting and makes it a little bit more complicated than the idea of yep it might as well not have happened is um music to my ears because i think there are lots of circumstances where it, it, that that is definitely the case anyway so um thank you for talking about that idea of forgetting because I, I i just love it like we talk about subsumption there are different I'm right in thinking there are different kinds of subsumption as well. So we, we say subsumption, what we mean that it, it, by that is there's an anchoring concept and you attach something, some new learning to that anchoring concept. And that anchoring concept is called by al a uh, subsumer. So this idea of like attaching new concepts to an anchoring one, to a subsumer, there are, there are different ways of doing that, right? Um, I say as if I, I mean, I, I read that in a book just a moment ago. So it's not me, like lots of prior learning, but that is the case. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I suppose like it's, it's, I think helpful for, for me was to realise that as you both says that the ideal way that we will teach will be to have a generalised concept that, that, that pupils have in their brains, not just something that, you know, you've talked to them about, you know that they know it, they have it, they're ready with it. And then they can can come to the lesson and or they come to the new material, sorry, and start to learn about that. So, for example, um, if pupils don't think don't know that molecules bond together, then there's no point in, in talking about ionic and covalent bonding because they, they don't have the higher, higher concept the more generalized concept of bonding in general. Um, so his idea is that you'd have that subsuming concept of, of bonding and then you can start to talk about more detailed ideas around bonding and types of bonding, for example. Um, so that would be like your typical kind of sub subsumption. And that's the way that he is, is advocating that, that, that we that pupils or learners in general will learn best. But there are also other ways of uh, other types of subsumption, as you've talked about, Chris. So there's something called derivative subsumption um, and not to put people off with the with the language but essentially he talks about like sometimes we we have a concept we know a concept or we know a, a proposition which is just like a string of concepts linked together a sentence essentially and we know something and then we learn some like um some stuff some like examples of it and those examples are pretty much well represented by this proposition anyway so then we end up forgetting the examples quite easily they're easy to learn but they're easy to forget 
because the proposition that we already have in our prior knowledge kind of represents them anyway. So an example of this would be in if you're teaching of mice and men, and then uh, Lenny in of, in of, in of Mice of Men, um, he, you might t- sort of teach pupils that Lenny doesn't know his own strength. Um, the character of Lenny doesn't, he doesn't know his own strength. And then uh, as you're reading the book, uh, pupils might pick up examples of this, where you might pick up that, um, that Lenny grabs a, a girl's dress at the beginning and, and rips it and doesn't realise how strong he is. And because, you, because pupils have kind of got this proposition of Lenny doesn't know his own strength, that example is just, it's kind of just an example of it and it can be quite easily forgotten because they've already got the proposition. If you want them to remember that example because they need it when they're writing a, a, an essay about it, they need to be able to quote things, you're gonna to have to go back to it quite a few times because it's gonna be quite easy for them to forget because their subsuming proposition actually covers it and that, that example might easily be forgotten so that's like derivative um subsumption and then you also get this um this other type of subsumption called correlative subsumption which is essentially when we're adding to these propositions and concepts that we already have so when we're extending them elaborating them modifying them um, and so like we're, we're sort of changing them or we're, we're kind of expanding upon them and then the concept itself is or the proposition itself has to change and it's more difficult to do that kind of learning but actually it sticks with us um, a bit more because um, because it can't it couldn't be represented by the initial prior learning that we had um, so for example let's say that um, we are we're in a PE lesson and pupils are, are learning about defense in basketball let's say and um, and you're teaching them you know, when we think about defense you think about kind of like blocking people and you might think about being a bit aggressive and that kind of thing and that might be their sort of prior knowledge but then you're also starting to teach them about how if you're good at defense in basketball you can start to dictate your opponent's actions by your behavior And that's not something that's already represented by their prior knowledge of defence. They didn't know that before. So that's an elaboration on that concept. That's something that's going to be quite hard for them to remember initially, but eventually it's going to kind of change and grow that concept of defence. And then it will be more challenging for them to kind of forget it. So they'll hang on to it a little bit longer than the derivative um, subsumption. There's also some other types of learning. I just want to talk about one one more, which I think is really cool, if that's okay. Um, So... When you, let's say you, you don't learn in the way that Ajabel sort of says, like he advocates for. So he advocates for having that generalised concept and starting to learn detail underneath that. But that doesn't always happen. But sometimes we get the detail and then we kind of learn a generalised concept that sort of swallows up that detail. And I love, I, I think, I really think, and he doesn't say this, but I think this, that this happens to us when we have moments of insight about things, you know, when we feel like we've, we've finally connected some stuff together and you're like, why did I not realize that before? And I think that that is this type of learning, which he calls superordinate learning. And essentially it's the idea that you get the bigger concept after the detail. For example, like a, a sort of bit of a bland example might be like if we're reading poetry or if pupils are reading poetry and they notice there are lots of kind of comparisons in the poetry and then they learn that there's um, this thing called similes or metaphors that are, and that, that concept sort of swallows up all these examples of the comparisons that they've learned. Um, but I think we can all think of times where we've had that moment of like light bulb moment where things get connected. And I think that might be um, similar to this idea of, of superordinate um, learning it's 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 such a cool subject just um i guess one more thing before we um move on a little bit one of the things that i think uh those those in the audience who have come across alcibel before and recognize the name are likely to say well i i associate his name with advanced organizers um what are advanced organizers and how do they relate to his theory yeah so this like cycles back to this idea that that Azubel is advocating for making sure that pupils have those subsuming concepts available to them in their minds when you are teaching them more detailed stuff. So they must have this idea of bonding in mind um, and understand what that means, generally speaking, if they are to learn more specific things about how metals and non-metals bond, for example. Um, so 
you know, he, I mean, and that also cycles back to that really important principle of like what a learner can learn is dependent on their cognitive structure and what they already know. So he's, if you think about that from Asriel's point of view, he's like, well, we need a tool for teachers to use to be able to make sure that that pupils can kind of have those subsuming concepts in mind before they teach the material, the more specific material. And he advocates for this idea of advance organizers. And they actually can be a lot of different things. They can just be verbal or they could be concept maps. They could be lots of different things. And there are lots of different types of them. Um, but let's say we want to use one that's just kind of furnishing them with the, furnishing them and making sure they understand these kind of subsuming concepts. We might use what, what he calls an expository advanced organizer. And essentially um, what, that's, what, what that would be doing would be explaining those um, more generalized concepts that they would need in order to understand the lesson material. And that could be done, as I said, in a, a diagram that is then explained to them. Um, it could just be done verbally. And there are lots of different ways um, that a teacher could do that. But the key point is that, these, that your pupils understand those generalized concepts and that they are going to be used to understand the more specific material that they're going to learn. Another one, so I'll just talk about one more type of advanced organizer, which I think is really important, is the comparative advanced organizer. So when, Ajibal talks about this one, because when you're trying to understand something, you're not just trying to understand it in relation to one generalized concept that you have. Often the material is pretty complex. You're trying to understand it in relation to quite a few concepts that you have. And what you don't want to do is confuse it with a similar, uh, similar concept or like, you know, you, you want to really understand the distinction between concepts. So, for example, let's say that you've got quite a lot of knowledge about Christianity um, and Ashville gives this example of like then learning about Buddhism. And, you know, there's there's quite a lot of, of differences between Christianity and Buddhism, but there's also some overlap as well. So what he's saying in order to kind of get this assimilation process right and not cause lots of misconceptions, a comparative advanced organizer is useful to, to make sure that people understand like this is the tenets of Christianity. Here's Buddhism. Here are the similarities. Here are the differences but in advance of kind of learning in loads of detail about it, where it could start to get, things could start to get lost and interfered with. So there's that idea of comparative advanced organizers can be useful if you're teaching a concept that might then be confused with something that pupils already know. And just a, a kind of wider point there of like, if you can almost see it as like, we're trying to fit this new material into an organized body of knowledge. So we don't just slot it in with the with the with the um, overarching concept. We actually have to negotiate it around other concepts that they know as well. And so these advanced organisers are trying to organise their knowledge. You introduced me to this stuff. Um, I'd read a little bit about Alcibiades without realising it a while ago. And as part of this discussion of advanced organisers, you introduced me to a little bit of software. I think I can't remember exactly what it's called, something like concept mapping or whatever it might be. C map, I think it is. C map, <laughs> that's the one. And I used that to create a like a visual map of my of, of what I think the most important things are to know about reading, which is now kind of available in places. But I found myself once I'd made it thinking, oh, this would have been so useful in my book <laughs> I, I reckon more people will have understood it and understood it well if that had been like at the front and then had been used so yeah I, I it's it I, I see some real value in this idea of advanced organizers because as soon as you kind of actually put one together as well be it a a visual concept map like I've described or um, a narrative, like a story that somehow describes the the, the overarching ideas you're going to describe, etc. As soon as you do that, as well as understanding a bit more yourself about what it is you're trying to get across, as you say, you give this, you make this overarching network of understanding clear so that you can see, well, how does this all fit together? So, yeah, I of all the bits that I think are most interesting about Alcibiades, um, his description of advanced organizers and their value is right up there for me.
Yeah, and I'd definitely go and uh, see Chris's um, concept map, which I think was, uh, I think Dylan William, didn't, didn't, didn't Dylan William also uh, enjoy your concept map, which is really cool. And um, that, that is, yeah, it, it, and I think that's something that has kind of come off of Azurebel's work with a, a guy called um, Novak and some work that he's done around um, concept maps. If you think about the sort of what you described there, Chris, I think it's really interesting. Like it was useful for you to like check your own understanding and like, oh, I suppose like um, how clear you were being in communicating um, what, you, what you were saying about reading. So it's, it's useful for you to do that concept map. So it's, it's both a way of like, of, of, of pupils kind of self-regulating a little bit, like checking their own understanding and like, where are my gaps and what do I not know? Where, where what concepts or propositions do I not like know where to put or connect? But it's also a, a good formative assessment tool potentially. If you train, you have to you have to train pupils to use concept maps and to um, create concept maps. You have to train them. And I was speaking to a really brilliant guy called Brian Moon, researcher who, who advocates for concept maps. But he always says like you have to train pupils really carefully on how to use them properly. Um, but if you can, you could use it for formative assessment purposes. Like they could create a concept map of let's say a novel that they're studying or you know, um, whatever it is, what topic they're doing. And you can see if they've got misconceptions because they've linked up concepts that you're like, oh, I don't know if they link or they've missed out links or maybe they've, um, the, or the hierarchy of the concepts is, is off. Um, and you're able to see maybe, maybe quite easily um, where, where their kind of uh, misunderstandings are as well. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just thinking about the idea of kids like learning, say, about ancient Egyptian civilization. And you can learn that, you know, they know, you know, they have a sense of what, the, how the word civilization is often defined. They understand a bit about the pyramids. They understand about the River Nile and its importance, et cetera, et cetera. But if they put together, you train them to put together a concept map and they've got, say, directly off the word civilization, they've got this idea of, you know, mummies or mummification. And it's straight off there. Not only do you you know, they might understand those two concepts to some extent, but they don't understand the connection to them. They, they, you can see that they've learned these two things, but they don't really connect directly. You can start to see the relationships of understanding that they have rather than just, do they know this thing? Do they know this thing? You can start to perhaps, you know, assess, as you say, whether they've grasped these connections. Yeah, and I, and I think it gets us, it gets us the closest, I think, it gets us the closest possible kind of way in a, in, a, in a reasonably short amount of time to seeing what their schema looks like um, to use a, a concept map if you've trained them to use it and that's like kind of the goal of formative assessment isn't it that we're not just trying to assess like what they know we're trying to assess like how they understand it and like those connections and what they write on those connections as well the linking words that they use can, could really betray um, in, could, could we betray some some real misconceptions that you wouldn't really get to with like short answer questions maybe so easy I don't know um that's just my hunch but I think yeah it could be a really useful tool I mean recently Sarah you wrote a, a fantastic blog on retrieval practice and potential lethal mutations was it influenced by your reading of Isabel yeah so Thank you. Yeah, um, it definitely was like it is totally changed the way I think about things. So I studied um, educational neuroscience recently and all the, the papers in neuroscience or the experiments and quite a lot in psychology, they have to control for prior knowledge. You have to make sure that the group that are sitting in front of you all have about the same understanding of the passage you're about to give them or the word pairs you're about to show them, right? Otherwise, that's a confounding factor and you're not really testing the thing that you that you want to test. So you end up with experiments where, um, where you've got a group of people who often are looking at things like word pairs and they're often like a sort of um, English Swahili word pair if, if, if they don't know any Swahili. And it's like, because they're deliberately making it so that no one's got any prior knowledge, the, the learning that they're getting those participants to do is very different from the learning that we try to do in the classroom. 
um, and Chris and I try to do um, on our on our programs. Um, so I kind of I think I fell into the trap, or I'm certain I fell into the trap when I was studying educational neuroscience of like of thinking about learning as retention because these studies measure retention. How well can um, Kieran and Chris recall this random word pair five minutes later, two days later, one week later, if I test them or get them to restudy it? So I, I fell into this trap of seeing learning as retention. And I feel like that's kind of the way that research makes us think about learning because it has to do that in order to isolate the thing that it's trying to measure. Whereas what Azubel talks about is that the goal is building bodies of knowledge and bodies of knowledge involve meaningful connections between new material and what we already know. That's that tapestry of knowledge, that, that hierarchy of knowledge that Chris was talking about. And that's very different from learning this kind of like little, little snippets of detached word pairs. And so in that blog, what I was trying to sort of say was that, you know, let's not lose sight of the end goal of retrieval practice. Retrieval practice is not getting pupils to learn individual like islands of, 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 of facts or, or knowledge. Um, actually, what we're doing is we're aiming for bodies of knowledge. And so we have to think about how we do retrieval practice in order to facilitate that end goal and not this kind of dis discrete elements. And that was purely through reading Ashevel that I sort of almost had this probably quite obvious insight, but it was it was it felt like a bit of a penny drop moment for me. No, I don't think it's obvious at all. And it's definitely something that I think is very possible. And, you know, I think the fact that you're sort of giving us a, a path away from it makes, you know, we should be very, very grateful. Before we sort of move on to the, the classroom and things, when I, when Chris sent me lots of papers or gave me sort of lots of recommendations, it took me a lot of time, a lot of questioning Chris to make connections. And I thought it, with every additional paper, I was a little bit more on board and I could see the bigger picture. So by the end of maybe between 1962 and 1970, I sort of thought, OK, I've, I've got an understanding of this. And I know that our listeners will be very keen to engage with the material. Do you have a recommended route into the work that sort of covers what you've so eloquently described so far? First of all, I think I, I feel like we should all congratulate ourselves for reading <laughs> for reading Azurel's work because I think it's really worth reading his his books and his and his papers. But oh my god, it's one of the hardest things. And I used to I was reading neuroscience before that, so it, this is this was one of the hardest things, um, Kieran, that I've that I've that I've read. I, I remember moaning to Chris about it quite a lot um, as I was trying to plough through his book. Um, so I think it's I think it's really worth engaging with um, the, the the papers that you were talking about. So there's, there are some short well, maybe we can like link to them in in the uh, in the notes um, because they're they're a little bit shorter and they summarise his ideas. Um, however, like he's got he's got some books that like if if you can if you can do it if you can dedicate the time to studying it you will not regret it. So I can I can only talk like this about his work because. The way he structures his book, Kieran, is incredible. So what he says about like these, um, these concepts, these generalized concepts, and then adding the detail, that's how he does his books. And actually he doesn't write using friendly language um, and he doesn't give a lot of concrete examples. So I think like, I would love it if he would, he would have done that, but he didn't. Um, but if you can get through his book, you will you will retain it because he goes back over things lots and lots of times. So there's a couple of books. I've got the one in front of me. I've got is the Educational Psychology: A Cognitive View, um, and that's a that's a really good one um, to have a look at. Slightly more digestible than his than his first book. Um, oh, sorry, the first book that I read, which is the Acquisition and Retention of Knowledge: A Cognitive View. But uh, if you can go, if you can do it, then then get get through the slog. If you can wait a little bit, then uh, I'm going to try and write a more digestible version um, that will hopefully be out, um, well, hopefully next year um, be out and, and Chris will have um, put a lot of, of his ideas and thoughts into it as well. So if you can wait for that, then great. But if not, we'll uh, his papers first and then uh, if you can, uh, a couple of his books as well. That's brilliant. Thank you. I mean, and it, it makes it all the more impressive that you've been able to furnish your sort of exposition with examples that are directly relevant to what most of our 
listeners, if not all of them, will be will be doing. Yeah, so. Kieran, that's that's thanks to Chris. Chris, this gives me so many concrete examples from across a range of subjects. Um, so I have to definitely credit Chris for that. Well, that's that's far too kind. But just to note, I would say as someone who's definitely less expert in this area than than you are, I the one thing I do like about Alcibel's papers is there are pretty good summaries at the end. Like sometimes you read a, um, a paper and you get to the end and then the summary is like, well, okay, that's actually not that digestible. Even though the papers can be a little bit winding at points, the, the it's always, I think, start of the summary of any paper, read that, then read the whole thing again, then go back to that summary. It's almost, well, almost as if that summary is itself a bit of an advanced organiser. Um, I mean, the abstract should do that, but it's the summaries of his papers in particular that are great. I think the most accessible one to start with is probably a subsumption theory of meaningful verbal learning and retention, the one from 1962, or that might just be my bias based because that's where I started. So we've talked about a lot of theory so far. What about, do you think there are implications for classroom practice based on this way of thinking about learning yeah definitely so I think like the first thing to st sort of start with saying is like there's not a load of like detailed concrete things that as Javel tells teachers not like he doesn't go into loads of detail about the application of this in the classroom so others have kind of picked up picked that up but he does talk and he does um, do research on advanced organisers, which we've already talked about. Um, and the research seems to suggest, generally speaking, that they're particularly useful for pupils who um, do not, who, who kind of lack the subsumptive kind of concepts in order to kind of engage with the material. So if you've got pupils that already have the concepts they need to understand the material, advanced organisers are not particularly, not going to do very much for them sounds pretty obvious but that's that's kind of what the research said, suggests but if if um, people are kind of new to the topic they or, or they lack those kind of generalized concepts that they need then advanced organizers would be like the kind of practical thing that he's he's kind of uh, uh, suggesting that they do and um, so other people have kind of got some more concrete things that we can we can suggest and I think there are some definite um, implications that I can quite easily draw out as well so if we're thinking about meaningful learning we're thinking about how do we get pupils to learn meaningfully um, and rather than kind of do it in a, in a more rote fashion so Ajabel talks about how like sometimes tests um, they uh, they sort of drive people the, the sort of assessments or tests that people do drive them to think that they have to learn things verbatim and learn them like rote they'll only get the marks if they learn things in a, in a certain way so we have to kind of get them to see that learning meaningfully and making connections themselves is really important so what so what do we do essentially like we need to know what they know we need to do really good formative assessment because as we said what the what learners already know is the biggest kind of variable in what they will learn so we have to do some really good formative assessment to work that out we've talked about potentially using concept maps to do that that could be helpful if we train them but we also need to make sure that they make explicit links between what they already know and the material that we're teaching them so we can make those explicit links when we're talking about the new material uh, but we have to make sure they also make the explicit things. Just because we said it doesn't mean that they think it. So we have to make sure we give them time to kind of make like like to, to sort of assimilate this new knowledge with what they already know. Um, and I've seen this referred to as uh, on uh, in brilliant blogs on Twitter as rehearsal. So like after you've explained something and after you've explained those explicit links, giving people's time to put it in their own words and to be able to make the meaning out of it by connecting it to what they already know. So we might use things like think, pair, share um, to do that, or we might get them to write it down and make those connections. Again, that could be like adding to their concept map, so then like literally making those connections as well. But that, that valuable time to get them to actually make the connections and to ask questions that test whether they have made those connections um, is really important. We also want to think about that forgetting process as well. So we talked about how during meaningful learning, um, the more generalised concept can kind of 
subs uh, like obliteratively subsume is the is the term that Asibo uses, but essentially engulf that new that new meaning, and they forget that new meaning. Um, so if we need to keep that meaning alive, then we have to revisit that material, um, and we and we can think about it in the way that Asibo talks about it. So um, we can think about they've they've made this new meaning. That's brilliant. They've had they they've kind of made this new meaning. We can see that they've done it by the end of the lesson, but we know it's vulnerable. We know it's vulnerable to that subsumption, that that um, that Venn diagram moving too close together uh, and kind of getting engulfed. So if we know that, then we're going to have to revisit that detail, um, and we want to monitor that, like that that how that detail is getting forgotten. Get them to revisit and retrieve that as well. Um, and as Jabal talks about the importance of like revisiting and retrieving in different contexts in order to, to kind of consolidate that knowledge. So, so broadly speaking, we've got practical things we can do to form the meaning and we've got practical things that we can do to make sure that the detail is maintained. Um, and I'm hoping in the book to be a bit more explicit about, about those kind of uh, concrete things that teachers can do. Along those lines, when you were talking there, one of the things I was thinking about, as so often happens under these circumstances, I was thinking about where I went wrong as a teacher repeatedly. The number of times that I thought, you know what, this is a brilliant analogy. I'm going to get children to understand this thing by making a comparison to something else. And then it just doesn't land. And the reason it doesn't land because they don't understand the other side of that analogy. So I'm comparing something I want them to learn to something they don't already know. And rather than then going, oh, okay, what do they know that's similar? What can I compare and contrast to this thing I want them to understand I kind of plowed ahead and said no I will teach you about this first thing so that you can make a comparison so but in, in practical terms if we are thinking about you know these anchoring concepts and these these kind of comparisons part of that might it might involve finding out okay so what do they already know that I can make an analogy of for this new bit of learning so that kind of changes our like initial formative assessment a little bit it's not just about finding out well what do they know about this it's what do they know that's adjacent to this that i can use as a frame of reference please appreciate how good this analogy is by me like, like teaching you how good the analogy not the content just how good this analogy is um i've done that so many times what i think that just reminded me when you said that of, sort of a bit of a penny drop moment for me with as felt another penny drop moment which was when he said that like for material to be meaningful to the learner they have to have the necessary prior knowledge to understand it it can seem really meaningful to the teacher that like you could pick up you could you could you could teach a novel that you think is bloody brilliant and you just love it and you just think it's great and you had so many thoughts about it afterwards and it maybe it shaped you as a human being it was that good and you could be really excited to teach it but it doesn't mean that it's meaningful at all to your pupils just like the analogy that we think is great is not meaningful at all to pupils because meaning is made in the mind of the learner and I think I just assumed that if it was meaningful to me that I could make it meaningful to pupils in the same way but you you just can't and when you appreciate the kind of uh, idiosyncratic nature of prior knowledge and how meaning is made by combining that idiosyncratic prior knowledge with new stuff then you realise that none of us are carrying the same meaning about anything. And it just, yeah, penny drop moment for me. I, I think a nice example of this, I was talking with uh, my partner, Sylvia, about how she teaches negative numbers um, and how she introduces the idea of kind of subtracting negative numbers and this sort of thing. And the number of times she has seen teachers and she herself in the past has taught it through like debt and bank accounts. And the kids are just like, well, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. And she compares that to success, the success that she has now when she's talking about it in terms of like the school's behaviour management system, which has positive points and negative points. And she talks about the idea of removing negative points being the equivalent of a positive. So this is where this idea of like subtracting negative being equivalent to positive. And again, it just shows this idea of you have to think not just about how well you're going to explain something. It's like, does this connect to what they already know? To the extent that she could go to another school that doesn't have this behavior system and suddenly nope that 
pedagogy, that way of explaining things is useless now. You need to find something else that's going to work with these kids in this context because they just don't have that freight, that same frame of reference. And, and funny enough, even though Azubel is not a fan of neuroscience um, and says that it doesn't have anything to offer, uh, which I disagree with, actually neuroscience, since his, he has written, it actually supports a lot of what he said, which I think is really, um, really cool. And like when you get different fields agreeing, you start to think that you're kind of maybe on the right track about things as well. Um, but I think with the forgetting aspect, it's like, and we've heard this before in, from, from, from psychology, which is like forgetting isn't the enemy. And I think that actually Azjibel's work sort of indicates that that's not the case either. So he talks about these bodies of knowledge, like bodies of knowledge are the way that we can hold massive amounts of ideas um, because they're all interlinked and because we forget the detail because we forget the detail we can start to generalize ideas and like see them more like see them in a more overlapped connected way so it's not necessarily a bad thing that detail that that, that that forgetting progresses in that way but it's if we want to keep that detail alive because it's important for people to know it then we're going to need to revisit it and I think that this like leads on to another great question that you both had around curriculum planning which is like a, like a brilliant question I think definitely as your bell like tackles which is you know if you want if you if you agree with his theory and you think the evidence is there for it and you want to kind of take that forward and this is already advocated for by a lot of a lot of people anyway is that having a kind of understanding of those subsuming concepts in your subject or the subjects that you teach um, and understanding which ones are necessary for pupils to know in order to understand uh, more detailed concepts and propositions and making sure they, are, they, they have those concepts in their cognitive structure before you teach them the detail. Well, that's a, that's a curriculum uh, planning exercise that, that takes um, kind of agreement within departments and phases and, and that, that changes the way you, you potentially structure uh, your curriculum and structure your lessons. If you agree upon the detail that they need to maintain as well, then you have suddenly got this bank of information that needs to be revisited and retrieved across the curriculum. Um, you have to accept that, that quite a lot of detail like will be um, forgotten. And by forgotten, we mean like not able to be retrieved, not like it's disappeared. It's just fallen under the kind of bar of being able to be retrieved. But you're, if you kind of go by this theory, then you are forced to think really carefully about concepts, about hierarchy, about the schema that you want um, pupils to create and about the detail that you want them to hold on to. And that forms, I think, um, the kind of substantive basis um, and even like sequential kind of in some ways basis for your, for your curriculum as well. I think one of the things I like about Alcibel and this clear description of um, knowledge potentially as hierarchically organized or one way of thinking about knowledge as being hierarchically organized is that I think it starts to give a bit of a sense of purpose around the idea of higher order concepts now I know they already have a bit of purpose people will say well in history a way of organizing the curriculum is around ideas of learning about trade or learning about civilization or agriculture or whatever the kind of the key concepts you want to pupils to understand through your curriculum but I think it's that you start to be able to say okay let's map these out in a way that makes really explicit that these are the concepts and that below that there's a layer of stuff that we're going to use explicitly to learn this stuff or at least that these higher order concepts are going to organize that layer below and then the layer below that we're getting into even more specific stuff and the further down you get the more you can think well, actually, this is the stuff that maybe it doesn't matter if pupils forget, using your terms, for, kind of forget this because it's very specific. As I, I think I've said a couple of times, like if your higher order concept that you are organizing part of your science curriculum around is the idea of like living things. And it's, yeah, you've, if kids, if kids come away from it, not come away from your curriculum, not knowing what a, um, a platypus is, then it's not the end of the world but if they come away not knowing what a mammal is that's a problem if they come away not knowing what a living thing is this higher and higher order concept then you've yeah then you've got real problems so you can start to think about what you prioritize within your curriculum based on 
this idea of a, a hierarchy, which I, which I, I think is really valuable. I mean, I've got a, a, a follow up question um, and it might be one of those ones, you know, more of a conversation down the pub rather than something you can speak truth to, or, you know, whatever truth is. But in my, in my mind, imagine, OK, so you, you say you took democracy as your example. The first time pupils will encounter that might be in year one when they look at the United Kingdom, maybe year two, they look at the royal family. Then when you get to three, four, five and six, you're looking at different empires and you know, Greece and, and how democracy formed over time. Do you reckon five, six years old is a suitable time? I'm, I'm not, I'm trying not to add a value because I don't have an opinion. You know, it might well be possible. Do you think it's possible for those children to have that broader concept of democracy before they really studied it in primary? Yeah, I think this is a really, really good question, Kieran. I think and it speaks to like what, what, how much is Azubel saying they need to kind of know? I think that's what you're maybe hitting on there. Um, how much do we need to know about these subsuming concepts to sort of start to learn the detail a bit? And I think like a, democracy is a really great example, actually, <laughs> that you've picked there because they they get they get as you say like a different diet of it as they as they get older through school they also might start as they get older and older start engage with with politics more potentially uh, watch the news more and they start to feed this idea of what democracy is what democracy isn't so you, you kind of I think you have a sort of like a crude they have a they start with a kind of crude general concept of it that gets fed um through like assimilating information into it so you know you said they might they might start off um early on um learning about it and eventually get to the kind of ancient greeks they might also get like go on the school council and like learn start to learn about like voting and things like that and that becomes like a, another kind of example for them and they might just see democracy in a very like plain quite sort of flat way and then when they get into school they start to see that there are different regimes in different countries that 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 are not democratic and then suddenly they've got these kind of like counter non sort of non-examples of it and stuff like that and then they're feeding this higher order concept so I think what Azabel would say is like they need to sort of start off with a kind of um a, a, an understanding of what democracy is but in, in a kind of in, a, in that sort of cruder sense of what it is and then you will be you will you will feed that um as as time goes on and um, something I've also I've missed out um is that he he talks about like development in quite a specific way so he says that like sort of when you're very young you don't learn things in the way that we've talked about so when so sort of pre pre kind of school age you don't learn about things through subsumption um, of, of concepts the way we've talked about you actually learn through things through through concrete experience so he says that there becomes a time where you know you, you you've kind of you you gained a lot of concepts through con concrete experience and then you're ready to learn in this subsumptive way so then so there's I don't want to misrepresent him as saying like subsumption happens from birth it's kind of like you need concrete experience in order to gain basic concepts like dog for example you need to have concrete experience of, of, of seeing dogs and and knowing what they are in order to to get that concept I think democracy is a really excellent excellent example to pick because what tends to happen is we teach it in school and we think of it as this really complicated concept because it is but the thing that makes the concept of democracy complicated isn't necessarily like the distilled concept it's the examples themselves it's the idea of like representative democracy it's athenian democracy that's where the complexity is if you get right up to kind of what you might think of as the the distilled higher order concept that is something absolutely that five and six year olds can get because the distilled higher order concept for me is like who makes the decisions is it me or is it all of us and and that's it i mean that kind of that's the yes you can say oh well that's a very simplified basic version but that's the it's a bit forgive the bit sounding a bit talking in platonic terms but that's like the ideal of it that's the that's the distilled version of it. And when we start saying, oh, well, yeah, but it gets complicated when you think about um, the relationships between democracy and capitalism, or we think about the, uh, the idea of representative democracy or the different voting systems, or we think about how it might interact with a constitution and all of that stuff. But that's the, 
that's the detail that kind of slots in below that at, the, at its highest the kind of the higher order concept becomes less and less about these complex about this complexity that comes from the examples at the very top this kind of core idea of democracy is who's in charge is it all of us or is it some of us yeah and i think you can see there how chris really helps <laughs> to make sense of all of this stuff in a really concrete way and as a really like really good way of, of putting it like it is possible to learn about it in that um in that kind of core way early on and then you sort of yeah you, you sort of you feed it with the more complex ideas and the, the more kind of connections that they start to make as you learn different things and if you think about how then forgetting happens like you've you've by through the subsumption of all those kind of more complex ideas you've got this richer understanding of democracy much richer understanding of democracy you've changed your prior knowledge but you might have forgotten the detail of when and where you learned that stuff you might not remember that you know your teacher taught you in year four about the ancient greeks or whatever it was so you've lost the detail but you've you still fed it with the with the kind of ideas that changed the nature of that prior knowledge a few subsumption happening with my understanding of ice and it says work you know I had this general sort of picture and it's getting more and more clear like I said thanks for talking to you guys you know but this is you know primarily a learning endeavor asking people questions about really interesting topics and um, I think we've got time for one more question Chris do you want to ask it yeah I was just going to say I mean we've, we've talked about loads of stuff and it's it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you I can't describe what a privilege it is to work with you I guess people who have been listening to this, I'm sure they would have been as fascinated as uh, as I've been. If there were a couple of just like key takeaways, like two or three things that you think, if in doubt, if you forget everything about this episode, this is worth hanging on to. What would those takeaways be? So I think I think it would be terrible not to say the most important sort of principle, which we talked about at the beginning that Ashbel says, which is. The most important thing is what your pupils already know. Ascertain this and teach them accordingly. And that is the kind of key thing that runs through everything he talks about, is that importance of what they already know. And you, you Chris, gave the great example of the analogy that didn't land. And I think that's that's like a good thing to kind of always have in mind. Like it, This is meaningful to me. But is it going to be meaningful to the learner? What do they already know? So I think that's probably takeaway um, number one. And I think like my my second takeaway, which might not be the same as if Azubel was uh, was was alive and on this on this podcast, but mine is that um, that we are aiming for uh, rich bodies of knowledge for for pupils. Um, we, we are not looking for retaining distinct bits of information. And if we want rich bodies of knowledge, one way we can think about doing that is through subsumption, which we talked about, um, and the idea of like, using the advanced organisers and thinking about knowledge in terms of like uh, more generalised concepts, thinking to the more detailed stuff. So those would be my, my two um, takeaways. But Chris, do add anything that you think would also be uh, a good takeaway from your reading as well and, and and Kieran I think it would be foolish of me to try and um, add anything onto what you've said there because that that makes total sense to me it's yeah thank you so much for coming on to the podcast um, and Kieran thank you for inviting me on again at the same time as Sarah that was uh, good timing and yeah I mean my advice would be to read your um, forthcoming work which summarizes the ideas and um, do you have a date for it or anything out there i don't i don't i i need to i need to i need to crack it's it's, it's half written and ready and, and and chris has uh has read the first half of it so um i think it we're good to go on the second half soon but uh, it should be out hopefully hopefully next year maybe maybe sooner who who knows but um but i must say it's so useful to talk about it and um, so thank you both so much for for um for having me on and allowing me to clarify um my ideas by talking about it as well so yeah i really appreciate it no the, the pleasure's been all ours so thank you very much and hopefully this won't be the last time you join us um, and maybe i'll understand it all a little bit more <laughs> but next time we do um, i think all i said to do then is say to everyone at home thanks for listening <laughs>